Welcome everyone. I also feel really excited about this conversation. Aisha, we we met probably about a month ago. The reason we're having this conversation now is because after the interview I did with you, I went into my bag and I pulled out, I'd forgotten it was in there, but I pulled out Diane's book, The Zen mm-hmm. of You and Me, and it it felt so appropriate for what we'd just been talking about that I thought, I'm gonna I thought this this is meant for you. So I so I gave it to you. Mm-hmm. Yes, there it is. And it, it felt really appropriate and I gave it to you and then you were you messaged me, you, I think you were reading it on the bus and you said, oh, I'm really enjoying the book. And I just thought there was a really natural segue and a really natural connection that was there with Diane, who I've known Diane now for probably eight months, maybe almost a year. We, we had the, the pri- I had the privilege of hanging out with Diane for a bit in California and also is one of the most grounded embodied empathetic compassionate uh people that i that i've spent time with and you both have that quality and it just felt felt like a very natural um yeah it felt like a very natural meeting that that you obviously were both up for and both keen to make happen well first of all i just want to thank everybody for being on the call and i'm really honored to meet you, Aisha, today. It's uh, uh, such a pleasure. It's so great to listen to your interview with David and to read about you online and to see what you've been up to and how you're just so beautifully expressing yourself and your, uh, your convictions and your clarity. I've, I'm deeply moved by it. And David, just a big shout out to you. I mean, yeah, I'm assuming you're both Brits. Is that well, yes. the case? And yeah, so, you know, we're apparently we're, we're, we're friends, you know, we, from we way back. We close to each other in Southampton. We actually come from the same city. Oh, is that right? Is yeah, that right? Yeah. And almost no one comes from there. So that's really interesting. Oh, really? That is interesting. Yeah. When I, I first spoke with David, um, and one thing that attracted to me to Rebel Wisdom in general was the fact that it was talking about cultural issues and things going on of the moment but it was also looking at it from frameworks that were maybe slightly more mystical or spiritual Mm -hmm. and these are things that aren't there isn't much space for necessarily Mm -hmm. I don't see in the in the mainstream public discourse Mm -hmm. and the way that I've come to this conversation has never been political um I've come to this conversation um maybe through something that people could consider close to yeah something of a of a more spiritual inclination i recognize that you know there is so much more to us to each other um than we're often led to believe or we often Mm -hmm. allow ourselves to see Mm -hmm. um and i recognize that there are certain ways of being that can really stop us from recognizing our commonality. Mm -hmm. And and when I saw things deepening in in that sense, you know, stopping this type of recognition that we have, that's what got me very curious about this cultural shift and this moment. It wasn't for me a left or a right thing. It Mm -hmm. just seemed that, you know, that, that there could be another way to look at some of these really contentious issues from a lens that wasn't solely political. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when I was speaking uh, to David, I I was saying, you know, like, I'm very interested in maybe trying to come across someone who who is maybe thinking about these things from from another, maybe more humanistic angle. And then Mm -hmm. there you are in his bag. Um, (laughs) And I I, I did read the book and and it was, um, it was really, uh, you know, because I had no expectations, you know, when he, mm-hmm. he gave it to me. I mean, I'm at, at, the point, at the moment, I get books given to me often. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you don't always, you, you kind of just half take it. You don't really know what to expect, you know, and mm-hmm. you're just kind of grateful and you're not sure if you're going to read it. <laughs> um, but you, you take it anyway. <laughs> um, but I did. I was on the bus and, and I have been, I don't know, just thinking a lot recently, uh, mm-hmm. as often, and, and especially with a new sort of increased platform, I guess I'm very much thinking about how, how best to serve, you know? And I just thought that maybe your book would have something in it and and it very much did. Um, And then I I did some more research and, you know, I I see you talking about compassionate conversations Mm -hmm. and maybe one of the things that I'm trying to learn how to do is how do we make people with opposing views see that the other side isn't evil, you know, but maybe just how do we show people that 
others who they disagree with just have different understandings of what is good rather than I'm trying to deliberately subjugate and oppress you. Of course, that happens intentionally Mm -hmm. in some areas, but I personally don't believe that's what most people set out to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, you know, like, how do, you know, what are some of the tools that you think for having more compassionate conversations? One of the things that comes up a lot in conversation these days, you know, I, I think in relationship to woke culture and to, um, you know, basically the, the effort to try to genuinely create equality, which is the, the upside in my experience of what's happening in terms of um, this kind of, you, you said something that I thought was interesting. You talked about the difference between being woke as though it's a done deal Mm-hmm. An awakening, which is an ongoing process. So whatever this wave of awakening is that's trying to happen, you know, one of the things that we're asked to do a lot, and I think it's, it's good for all of us, is just simply learn how to listen. Learn how to listen to somebody else's experience that is different from our own, that maybe they've drawn different conclusions and different beliefs based on that. And to be able to do it in such a way where we distinguish what we're hearing um, from agreement. We may agree, we may not. We may have a different set, as you were saying with David, that really different set of life experiences, but our capacity to receive and hear someone else's experience, that that language of, you know, can I understand? I don't quite know what that means. Can I hear and can I take in what someone else is telling me? Absolutely, I can, without a doubt. So that quality, that ability to really listen and receive and not allow our own reference points, our own desires, our own needs to get in the way, I think is a fundamental skill that we all need to have. So even just the way that you're listening to me right now, I can feel the quality of your receptivity, that you're actually taking in what I'm saying. You know, so I think that's super fundamental. Because it's easy to listen when I hear something I agree with. It's easy to listen when I hear something that I'm at least open to, but it gets really difficult to listen when I hear something that I don't agree with and even harder to listen when I myself feel criticized Mm -hmm. or challenged or called out or whatever, you know, that's one of the real skill sets that we need to develop is an an ability to realize that we can listen in spite of being stressed. You know, that's something we can do. So I would start there with just that basic skill. Mm. And so why do you think that, you know, I, I think you're right. I think listening really is key, of course. And it sounds simple, but I mean, I don't think many of us do it very well. We don't. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. We think we do, but we actually don't, especially when we're stressed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I often think that it's, it's probably the things that we disagree with that we probably need to pay closer attention to, yeah. you know, or that probably that we need to listen to more of, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe it's worked in my favor, but I've always just been very naturally interested in ideas that I disagree with mm-hmm. um, because I've always been keen to know, well, how does someone get to that? Mm-hmm. You know, like, because I guess if you truly do maybe think an idea is harmful, you know, rather than condemning that idea off the bat I mean which you can do but if you want to maybe stop the flow of those ideas then you have to be able to understand like you know what drives people or draws people into these types of things um so yeah I've always I I really think that that type of thing um yeah listening to to or becoming more curious about Mm -hmm. what we dislike I think is is quite key yeah, well, I, I, I think it's something that you, I've observed both you and David do well. And it might be fun at some point during the conversation, maybe we can find a way to disagree with each other so we can model that. I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that we tend not to see very much online is we don't see healthy disagree. Well, maybe we do. Do you guys feel like you see people disagree and challenge each other online? You know, you're right, because when I was listening to you today, I remember you said something somewhere, and I think actually this might have been around the Me Too movement. You were speaking to someone about that. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere you said something like you like to, um, you like to encourage disagreement sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You you like to work with that. Uh, And I think that's interesting because I would say you're right when it comes to um, uh, podcasts and alternative Mm -hmm. media, I guess Mm -hmm. often we're speaking to people who. Who agree with us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we don't often have that space. So I wouldn't, I would say on Twitter, mm-hmm. I often find 
the, the way that I use Twitter, and I've been very grateful because I see that it doesn't happen with many people, but sometimes people disagree with me and they're, it's the most, it's the most beautiful disagreements I've ever heard. You know, like yeah, people yeah. are just kind of more than sort of angry or aggressive. They're just kind of like, oh, you haven't considered this. Do you uh-huh. remember this? Yeah. You know? yeah. And I'm just like, oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah. I didn't consider that. I will yeah. next time. Yeah. Um, so sometimes on Twitter it happens, uh, but generally speaking, no, I don't see it very often. So that's something I think we can actually start to model. And we've been talking with David a little bit about what would it be like to actually start to have conversations with people of really different worldviews and see what we can learn about doing it online. So the, the curiosity that you're, that is such a driver of how you relate to the world, you know, fundamentally one has to have, one has to be a good questioner. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you ask good questions? How do you, know, as you said, do you like to actually, you gravitate towards uh, opinions that aren't your own because you're interested in how people arrived at them. So that very process of inquiry, that process of questioning, of being curious, I think is another one. And again, I will say that, you know, the channel's done a great job with working with polyvagal theory and working with embodiment and working with somatic responses. But lots of times what keeps us from either listening or inquiring in a real way is literally just the, re- the response of threat in the nervous system. For you to be able to hear something you disagree with and be curious is actually counterintuitive. Usually we move away from the thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like almost like amoeba, you know, you, there's a stimulus and if it's something that we don't like, we just simply move away. And so to turn and inquire into that is counterintuitive. You know, so that that's an that's an amazing thing to be able to do in my mind. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, and, and again, it's from life experiences that I've had so far. You know, we watched uh, the interview with David and I. You know, I, I spoke about you know my brother's passing and, and mm-hmm. wanting to understand mm-hmm. what happened. You know, essentially what could drive a young man to take someone else's life and things like that. And I think once you're dealing with you know tragic things like that. I guess everything else, if I'm honest, it doesn't really, it doesn't feel as threatening in comparison. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so as much as that was a really tragic situation, like I'm, I'm grateful for the sort of, how can I put it? I'm grateful for the tolerance it's given mm-hmm. me in, mm-hmm. in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I was also going to say to you, um, and also what I found really interesting in the book, and, and which is something that I never knew about before, and I, I guess I mentioned it to David in the beginning, is, you know, you talk about these different stages of being, maybe, is maybe mm-hmm. what I can call it. And I remember mm-hmm. the ethnocentric stage, mm-hmm. um, the world-centric stage, and things like mm-hmm. this. Um, do we, how do we... Because maybe it's not possible to um, help people sort of move through these stages. I, I'm starting to believe that it's something people can only do on their own. Mm-hmm. But so for, let's say, like people like myself who are quite critical, you know, mm-hmm. or concerned about mm-hmm. the excesses of the woke movement, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been trying to tell myself for some time now, you know, when I'm trying to not get too frustrated and I'm trying mm-hmm. to and also remember that I've been in that place in many mm-hmm. ways mm-hmm. you know how do we try to how can we remind people because I think there's a danger in in becoming so anti the thing that you don't like that you are also now that mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. you know and so how do we sort of because what I don't see I think enough of sometimes is you know I don't often see people trying to understand their worldview enough because what mm-hmm. I see there and I think it's overlooked a lot is a lot of pain you know yes. and I think anger, yes. Yes. anger is a anger is a, a more sort of socially acceptable presentation of pain mm-hmm. you know but I, I mm-hmm. think it's pain and hurt that's mm-hmm. really there um and mm-hmm. which is why I try not to be demeaning of them mm-hmm. I may be critical mm-hmm. but not demeaning what do mm-hmm. you do I hear that yeah I hear that um so there, there are kind of three different things going on for me in what you're, what you're saying right now. So the first one is just back to that original question that, that you posed at the beginning around state stages, mm-hmm. structure stages of development, and what does that have to do with everything? So a little something on that. And then the other two things I heard you say 
is that people, that how humans develop and grow is a bit of a mystery. You're starting to think people can't be coerced. They actually, it has to be something almost that you elect into. And I think you're right about that. And then the question of how is pain, and maybe we can use the word trauma because that's, you know, people are working with trauma these days. How can trauma be related with in a way that we become liberated and free to love rather than now oriented around how traumatized we are, because that's the other danger of trauma, right? Is that then it becomes the identity. Mm. So, you know, how do we actually work with that? So just in terms of state stages, I found stages of development really helpful to me in my mediation work. And as I said in my book, I went from, I just naturally started using Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross's stages of grief because I was doing work at the time uh, a lot of conversations related to race. I was working in the judiciary and we had a racial and ethnic fairness task force. And this was 20 years ago. I can't believe how long it's been. And I just saw such a range of availability and the way people showed up in the conversation from denial all the way to absolute flex- flexible, warm-hearted freedom, availability, creativity that I was just, I couldn't help but start to create categories, you know, mm-hmm of people, right? Regardless of race or ethnicity, people who were, you know, in denial that there were any issues, people who were angry and advocating at the top of their lungs, fair enough, people who'd kind of found a niche that worked for them, bargaining, people who were just didn't want to relate and were sad. And then these, as I said before, just these people who were immensely free, and I got very curious. That's when I was introduced to Ken's work. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is important is how identity is held in the body-mind has a lot to do with what we're able to experience and what we're able to convey and communicate with. So when I hear you talk, what I hear you say is I can pick up an identity, but I am very in touch with that in myself that's beyond identity. I'm not limited to the fact that I'm black. I'm not limited to the fact that I'm a woman. I'm not limited to my sexual identity or my gender identity. It's actually fluid And sometimes people do relate to that as a privilege. Mm -hmm. There's a privilege to be free of identity. And, and, you know, there may be some truth in that. But what I say in compassionate conversations that I think is important is it's a privilege I want everyone to be able to experience. It's a privilege we want to share to be free of identity. And I think we can. And sorry, that's a really, I'm glad you brought that up. And, you know, it was just a few weeks ago that I've been thinking about identity. And I think in my own personal journey, I don't know how much I promote it, maybe subtly, I'm sure it can't help but creep into my ideas. Um, But I'm very interested in this idea of transcending identity. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that you point out from speaking to me that, you know, or you can clearly feel that I'm not someone, or I try not to be someone bound by my race, you know, gender sexuality or anything like that you you said it those are the least interesting parts of yourself i thought that was an that was a really interesting (laughs) thing to say and it made me think like maybe those are the least interesting parts of myself i haven't thought about it so i I love that you said that thank you i'd like to i'd like to think so i'd like to think that those and 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 i think maybe one of the reasons why I, i take a lot of the time that we're living in now to heart is that many people are intent on telling me that actually the most interesting thing about me is being black um and i think i find that very difficult and i think because if we're telling people the most interesting things about them are their identity um then they will never know what can be beyond that and and there is something about identity that i do find quite limiting um and i was saying it probably just on twitter the other day that i think the fixation with our identities can limit our mm-hmm. identities. Yeah. You know, so let's say I'm a black, you know, woman. And so maybe that means that I can only listen to or read other black women and anything mm-hmm. that isn't that I'm going to be naturally hostile about or mm-hmm. considered to be a threat. You know, I'm just limiting my own worldview um, or, you know, my ability, limiting my, my own capacity to connect with people. Mm-hmm. And so but the problem is like identity right now, is is so um big you know it's so important for people and you know i i'm but i feel a real freedom you know and i can't necessarily i'm not saying like life is perfect and that you can i don't know buy your way into a ferrari Um, but what i am saying is that like i 
I feel a sense of freedom, you know, I feel a great sense of freedom in being able to use my, my short time here. And I'm very hyper aware of that To yeah. um, That's something you and I have in common. Interesting. Yes, I did read that in your book. I remember I, I smiled to myself and I felt comforted because I think you were talking about your sister and you were talking about, you know, the differences between you and your sister and you are the type of child who was always contemplating the meaning of life. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was totally. definitely me. Um, and my uh, sister was crushing it. You know? Yeah, right, right, right. And so, yeah, no, that's completely, completely me. She um, still is. <laughs> no, no, I, I bet. Um, so, yeah, you know, how, how do you think we kind of go about, you know, because I guess in order to transcend identity, people want to want to know well, well, what's left. You know, it's not mm-hmm. my identity. If it's not my blackness or my manhood or mm-hmm. you know, my femininity, then then what is for me? And so what- can, can I ask you a question about that? Because one of the things that I found really interesting is when you talked about your the, I, I loved that. And I'm, I'm thinking about those of you who are listening right now, you know, like one of the things that we do know in developmental theory is that lots of times there's a crisis when people will shift identity or shift stages or be able to take on more worldviews or, or more perspectives. Something like, like they come to an existential crisis or a loss. But when you describe that lying on the bed and seeing a slideshow of all your most fundamental questions that were extremely raw and very intimate, and in a certain way, what I heard you say is you they couldn't be avoided and that the answers were so in, in some ways, like um, what would the, what would the word be? You said raw, that you were so intimate with yourself and there was sort of no getting out of it in a way. And, and to me, I'm curious what gave you access to this part of yourself that isn't limited by your respective identities. And was it related to that crisis? How did you, how, how did you get in touch with this part of yourself and how do you recognize it as being beyond identity? Um, Does it, is that a good, is that, it is that a question? Really good question? Such a good question. I probably may not have thought about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I, so like I said, for me, it was, um, you know, the catalyst was, you know, a close death in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, you know, the first time I'd ever experienced something like that. And immediately I could tell by the way that people responded in my family that they didn't actually have much belief. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I they did have beliefs. My family are Muslims. Mm-hmm. Um, however, you know, this sounds weird to say, and I don't mean any disrespect to them or, and of course, definitely not to the faith. But what it seemed as though is that they were clinging on to religion almost kind of as an insurance policy, as mm. a kind of like, you know, just in case, you know, I'm going to hold on to this. But I could see they couldn't always lean on it um, mm. for, for warmth and, 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 and sort of protection when they most needed it. Mm-hmm. And so that made me think, well what is that thing? You know, because people are going to, I'm going to keep losing people, you know, people even closer potentially. So what am I going to do? Um, and I guess that kickstarted this, um, this search for something. And at first that was for maybe a tribe, maybe a community, maybe mm-hmm. truth, or maybe mm-hmm. something akin to that. And I don't know. I think, uh, I think when I realized how, when I realized that, you know, so from this sort of awakening that I had, I realized how much of myself I would cut myself off from because it mm-hmm. didn't fit the narrative mm-hmm. of maybe what a black girl does, what a woman does, what a woman is supposed to think, what a black person on the left is supposed to think, or maybe um, just all of these things became very very suffocating. They were very suffocating all of a sudden. Um, and I recognized that I'd always had the ability to connect with anyone of any race, gender, you know, background, social mm-hmm. class. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's very hard for me to explain, um, but it's, sorry, it's really good to think about. And I'm really trying to give like um, a real answer, but I just, I just looked around me and I saw that it seemed to me that people cling to identity because they were scared of this other thing, Mm -hmm. this other thing that isn't always so pretty. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a bit dark, sometimes a bit bit messy, and it definitely isn't the 
image of yourself that you like to portray everywhere. But once I realized that that thing doesn't make you bad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Once I realized that acknowledging these um, undesirable aspects Mm. of yourself do not make you bad. Once I took good and bad out of my vocabulary, almost, at least in the way that I think, um, I think that made it very easy to explore anything. That's what, what you're saying is so important right now, because I think it's the piece that when people do diversity work that they don't do well at all, which is if we're going to, if we're going to substantiate a difference, if we're going to substantiate a difference based on our race, based on our gender, based on whatever religion, whatever it is, we have to unpack how quickly we assign good and bad to those differences because it's there immediately. So if we don't help people unpack and let go of those value judgments, we're, we're just creating difference and binding people to these up and down relationships. So what I hear you saying is that, that there was some way in which your encounter with your life, yourself, including the things that you were trying to do, the ways you were trying to be, but also those things, maybe we would call those things shadow, that the part of ourselves that we feel like we can't show to the world because they're too shameful. And that when you, when you uncoupled those, ex- that part of who you are from this value judgment of good and bad, that was where freedom was for you. That's incredible. Yeah, no. And, incredible. you know, so now I try, I try to think of good and bad. I only try to think of things in terms of um, constructive and, and destructive. Yeah, so I, I try not to, you know, so, and, and that for me, and so that only tells me if something is you know, productive or construct, you know, productive or, or useful or not. But it isn't about something being uh, morally, you know, incorrect and things mm-hmm. like that. And so, yeah, it just, yeah, I, I really think it, you know, it, it truly does give us a sense of freedom within ourselves. But also when I acknowledged some of the things that make me ashamed of myself, you know, and some of the things that were living in me, and recognizing to what extent that they were unspeakable, some of these things, and then recognizing that everybody, because I'm not that unique, you know, we're all living with our own versions of these things, you know, and, you know, it really started, you know, and I really felt for everyone. I really felt for everyone, you know, some of the... I really feel for everyone too. Yeah, no, for sure. Like some of the most all of the things that make us maybe the most human are some of the hardest things to share. Totally. And like you said, that one of the other things you and I have in common is my kind of existential confrontation also came in the wake of death, Mm -hmm. you know, where I lost these friends. I lost seven friends in like six months and uh, four in a plane and one committed suicide. Anyway, that six month period was just this really, really deep, and I didn't have a lot of guidance. It doesn't sound like you had guidance particularly. Like this was just an encounter you had kind of entirely on your own. You thought I was mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did. Yeah. It's incredible. But you found your way, you found your way through to a place of, of freedom, of compassion and empathy. And also basically that question that you began the call with, how do I serve? I mean, that's a question. If, if we could all find our way to that question genuinely, genuinely, and stay in relationship to that question, that, that's a, that would provi- provide a map, David, if we could ask that question in some kind of very real way. And I'm, I'm also very touched by the fact that you and I are talking to each other as women and that there are men on the call that are just sitting there listening and taking in what we're saying and you know, there's such a complaint that somehow, you know, males are not available to the f- female experience or the, you know, and I just want to give you a shout out in this moment. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you. To us. I, I yeah. Agree. yeah. Yeah. Very you're, cool. You're now, you're now making me really scared to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was actually a ploy just so we could keep talking. <laughs> Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. 
Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>